Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Laura Plummer, and I am the Assistive Technology Program Coordinator for the state of Wisconsin, and excited to uh, bring us a topic today that we all need, need to have, especially for our continuing education. So we'll, we're here today to talk about ethics. So welcome to the fourth WISTEC virtual training um, for the year. And so WISTEC is Wisconsin's Assistive Technology Act program, and that is operated under the Department of Health Services and the Bureau of Aging and Disability Resources. So WISTEC brings our trainings to us free for the participants as well as our continuing ed units and our CRCs. So we um, are excited to have everyone join us today. So just a few housekeeping items. This is a webinar platform which means that your audio and visual video is all automatically turned off. The meeting is being recorded and will be archived and available for viewing later on the WISTEC AT Council YouTube page. And we have got two hours of ethics training today and we will be providing continuing education units and CE CRCs and how you will get those is we will be sending out a survey after the training which you will be required to complete and then you'll input your information and then approximately about a month from now you will receive the crcs and ceus in the email we do have captioning available which you can access using a button at the bottom of your screen we also have sign language interpreters so if you click gallery view, you're gonna be able to see our speaker. You'll be able to see the interpreters as well as the PowerPoint. So I believe that's it for housekeeping. Again, excited to see a lot of familiar names here and um, looking forward to learning this morning. So without further ado, we have ethical considerations um, for the VR professional, but really, for all service providers and all professionals. So I'd like to um, welcome Linda Hedenbland. So she is a national speaker on the topic of ethics. Um, several of us I know have had the opportunity to sit there, to sit in on some of her sessions live. Um, and they're always full of energy and very fun. Um, so she speaks on ethics, on service delivery, um, services for people with disabilities, and she's got a lot of good information to share. I do see one question um, I neglected to share that with that survey that comes out, that email will also include the, um, the PowerPoint handouts. We make those available after the session. So, Linda, if you are ready, we're ready to go. I am ready. I was just uh, yelling to my husband to come and take care of uh, a, a crying cat. <laughs> Welcome to being in my in my kitchen, everybody. Um, it's nice to it's nice to uh, to be here. Um, yes, this is ethics for really ethics for anybody. This is ethical considerations and and um, ethical thinking and and so on and so forth. And we're really I'm really glad to be able to be here today. Um, so let's see where should we start? Let's start at the beginning. Um, uh, my name is Linda Hedenblad, as was mentioned, and I work with the VR Development Group. It's a company that I put together um, that provides continuing education and CRC credits for VR professionals um, and continuing education uh, credits for anybody. And you can find those online classes at vrdevelopmentgroup.com. I've also, in the last uh, four years, started a learning management system with a colleague of mine. Uh, he is the genius behind the technology, and I am the, uh, the one that does everything else, which is a surprising amount. Um, but we decided after working online with uh, various platforms for learning management systems that we were unhappy with the level of accessibility. And so we created our own platform that's accessible to people with disabilities. So I'm very happy to be here today. It's nice to talk to someone other than myself uh, for a change. The 
Q and A, the the um, the boxes there. That feel free to put in any questions, anytime that you have a question or comment. Happy to follow that as as we go along. And in the meantime, let's get started with with ethics. All right. Okay. So, our objectives for today in this in this two hour time slot that we have together is we are going to kind of look broadly at the definition of ethics. We're going to process through some situations with as much interactive discussion as we can have with 176 people. Um, and we're going to practice ethical thinking models and we're gonna explore ethical boundaries. And in my years of teaching ethics, and I think I've been teaching ethics for 15 years now, I've been all over the country and I've had many opportunities to, to work with different disciplines and, and uh, different individuals, different parts of the country that have um, different cultural uh, focus and so forth. And what I've discovered is that there are some things that really are broadly in common and some ethical issues that we all seem to struggle with. And those will be what we cover today. So I thank everybody for being here and for taking your time and and uh, let's get going. All right. So whether you're counseling, whether you're a counselor, whether you're a, um, an administrator, whether you're working with um, uh, as a community rehab provider, whether you're working doing assessment, however your work is, is being performed today, chances are most of it is being done at a distance. And I wanted to just bring up COVID-19 here for a moment on how it's impacting the services we delivered, but more importantly, more importantly, how uh, COVID-19 is affecting our client populations. Um, I was talking to someone from an independent living center the other day, and she said, you know, that they were grieving losing about uh, four four individuals from the independent living so, uh, center due to COVID. So while things are a struggle for us, most of us are still employed. Most of us are still able to do our work from home or do it, you know, partly in person and partly at home. But the, for those we serve, the people that we serve, just as just a reminder for everybody that, you know, really understanding what happens to resources, um, you know, what's happening uh, with people who are, have low income jobs who have to go into work, um, people uh, who rely on school, school meals for those uh, individuals who have kids in school, the, where the schools are closed or they've gone virtual, um, not having enough money to go paycheck to paycheck. I mean, that's typical for a lot of us. And can you imagine, being on the lower um, side of um, the, the poverty line, right? And how difficult that is. So for all of us, and then of course, there's people with disabilities often have, especially people with the most significant disabilities, have a lot of interaction with um, caretakers and so forth. And so the risk of COVID for people with disabilities besides the pre-existing conditions is, is higher. So when we're thinking of when we're thinking of our jobs, when we're thinking of how things have changed, um, I just encourage everybody to remember that no matter how hard this is hitting all of us, it's certainly hitting our clients um, probably much harder. So let's keep that in mind. All right. And also, some people are uninsured who get COVID and who survive, and that is uh, costing some people tens of thousands of dollars. So with that perky start, I did want to just put us all in the mindset. I think sometimes it's hard to remember when we're struggling with something um, that one of the best ways to get past that with our resilience is to think about others. Okay, so think about those we serve. All right, so today's counseling, um, we're looking at uh, and when I say counseling, I mean any interaction that happens between a consumer and, um, and a professional, okay? So let's use that as our broad brush with counseling. 
Um, but right now we're looking at accessibility, uh, especially under times of COVID, right? So how many people have computers? Are the computers accessible? What about the software we're using with clients? If you are working at a distance, um, the accessibility has come even more into play. There's the legal considerations that switch around a bit when it comes time for um, working at a distance with individuals. And then through from the CRC code of ethics, this is uh, directly from there. It's the issue of competence. When technology is used in the counseling relationship, rehab counselors are held to the same level of expected behavior and confidence as defined by the code, regardless of the technology or its application. So we bring this up because things have changed in the last six months quite a bit. And we need to be um, respectful and understanding of the technology that our clients use, um, how technology is impacting our service relationships. Just because you're at home mean, doesn't mean you can talk to people without your pants, right? <laughs> I mean, there's certain levels of professional behavior that we have to maintain even if you're not standing up during the meeting, right? You should have that level of professionalism so that you know, um, so that you know you carry that forth in your interaction with individuals. It's interesting. Uh, one of my colleagues at George Washington University said that one of his students came in and was uh, came in with wet hair and turned the turned the mute button on, but dried her hair and then curled it on camera for during the whole hour. Um, my, my son, who is going to college, uh, and that's uh, virtual right now, he said during the whole class he could hear someone hitting a bong. So I know that those are two things that you're not going to do, but just remembering that we are in a very different place right now and that um, how we carry ourselves in our professionalism, how we use technology, how we interact with people and understand and respect their knowledge of technology, that all of that right now is um, something additional that we have that was thrown upon us uh, with the pandemic. All right, and so if you have any questions, just make sure you feel free to ask. All right, so we're gonna start off with a little poll here. And you can answer your poll by putting um, in the Q&A, do you, whether you, uh, yes or no, okay? Do you believe you're more ethical than most? So do you believe that you are more ethical than most people? And be honest, because after all, this is ethics class. So do you believe you're more, um, uh, more ethical than most? Let's take a look. All right, we've got people coming in and answering here. That's very exciting. Okay, and it looks like, um, Laura, that I'm, I won't be able to see the Q&A with the setting that I have. So maybe you can let me know uh, what people are, what the majority of people are saying. We are seeing responses in both chat and mm -hmm. in the Q&A. Okay. And I'm seeing a wide range, um, quite a few no's actually. That, okay. um, someone actually said, I think there's a lot of good people out there. How nice to hear that. Yeah. So I think I'm seeing a wide range, um, more split than I thought actually. I thought yeah, many it's very were. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I'm looking at the chat. I'll keep an eye on the chat if you want to keep an eye on the Q&A. Yeah. And it, like someone says actually maybe perhaps but it's tough yeah yeah and a lot and so many people are saying yes mm -hmm. i see that as well um yes <laughs> i see a few maybes oh you can't respond to the actual poll i see somebody asking that right now the poll's not poll function isn't set up but that's okay because we can we can take it from the chat or from the q a all right well thank you i try that's awesome all right, well now let's, let's take a look at, at, um, at the next slide, which hopefully will be telling for all of us. 
92% of Americans, and this was a very large poll done by Robert Prentice, and, but 92% of Americans believe they're more moral and ethical than most. 92%. So I'm not a math genius. If I was, I think I would have gone into a profession that pays a lot more. But 92% um, of anybody really can't be, you know, 92% can't be more than, of course, they're more, right? But 92% believe they're more moral and ethical than most. Well, this leaves us, this, this is shocking to me when I saw this poll. I think what this says to me is that we all have an overinflated sense of our own ethics. That's what that says to me. And 92% of us have an overinflated sense of our own ethics. And I saw back and forth here. Some people say yes, some people say no. And it, it doesn't matter where you come out. Maybe you are more ethical than most. Um, but what I, what I really want to tease out today is how complex that question is, how complex it is, how complex ethics are, how absolutely um, just fascinating the human brain and how we deal with ethical issues is. So if whether you said yes, whether you said no, whether you said maybe, whether you say I'm not sure, whether you said I'll try, that's a great place to start. So now 61% of doctors uh, believe that, believe that um, freebies given out by pharmaceutical companies um, affected the judgment of other physicians, but only 16% believed that it uh, affected their own judgment. Now, this is a great place to start too. 61% of doctors that were under the same type of poll that Robert Prentice did um, believed that the freebies given from pharmaceutical companies to other doctors impacts their decision making. But only 16% said, oh, no, it impacts me too. Okay. So you see that? You see the people, doctors even, tend to think maybe a little more highly of their own ethical decision making than they, than they give their, um, their colleagues credit for, right? They can see or believe that their colleagues are swayed by these pharmaceutical freebies. Now, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen out there, these freebies are outstanding. <laughs> They're unbelievable. I have um, a couple of friends who are doctors and they get trips. They get, they get trips to conferences where the conference doesn't even really happen. They get, you know, all kinds of goodies and free things. And I mean, you know, we get in trouble if you take, um, you know, if you get a free pen from a, from a, um, uh, a vendor or something like that, right? You feel like you have to turn turn it all over if you get cookies from a from a client, but these folks are really able to take some very big uh, freebies from the pharmaceutical companies, and there's a reason the pharmaceutical companies do this. Same reason that vendors that you work with might give you a Christmas present. It's because it works. It's because it works. Um, if you want to think fondly of a particular medication, a particular vendor, um, if you want to think fondly of, um, of a, a, a particular client, right? If you, if you receive goodies from that person, it is going to impact the way you feel about them. Now, you, might, you could argue that, well, I'm going to use my better judgment and I'm really going to fight against the way this made me feel. Uh-oh. Okay, good. I, everything froze up on my end for a second, so that's always a little frightening. Um, but, uh, but, you know, so um, it, it, you can make the case that it's not going to affect you. But as you see here, doctors believe, oh, yeah, that affects the majority of my colleagues, but it really doesn't affect me. This is, this is a problem. This is a problem. All right. We're not, again, this is like the last example where we're not thinking clearly about um, our, own ethical, our own ethical stance and how we're impacted by things. So let's start with a very 
basic ethics problem. This comes from philosophical ethics. This might, if you took a philosophy class, this might be something that you um, have partaken in. If you saw the, the good life, um, you might have seen this trolley car problem in there as well. But this is a, a nice start for ethical um, philosophy. So let's say you're walking near a trolley car track. We're just gonna call it a train track. So you're walking near a train track when you notice five people tied to it in a row. In the next in an instant, you see a train hurtling toward them out of control. There's a signal level lever within your reach. If you pull that lever, you're gonna divert the track so it misses the five people, but it will run over one person. If you don't pull the lever, it will miss the one person, but it will drive, it will drive over five. And you don't have enough time to call and you personally can't jump in front of the train, that won't make any difference. Um, your only choice is you have like two seconds. Your only choices are pull the lever to save five people and kill one, or leave it be and let the train run over five people but save the one person. So this time maybe, maybe let's use the chat if you can find it on your, um, on your site there, on your uh, screen but how many of you would pull the lever? So would you pull the lever or would you leave it alone? Pull the lever or leave it alone. Those are your two options. What a horrible decision. Yeah, what a way to start out the day, huh? Save the five, pull the lever, pull the lever. This is hard, but pull the lever. Pull the lever, pull the lever. Everybody's pulling the lever. Leave, one person said, leave it alone. Pull the lever. Pull, leave, two people say, leave it, pull it and ask for forgiveness. Yeah, that's good. It's a greater good kind of thing. You're right about that. Call the Hulk. <laughs> the Hulk isn't showing up. You'd probably freeze. Yeah, that's a tough decision, isn't it? Untie the five. Sorry, Diane, good thought, but you don't have time. Leave it alone or pull the lever. Okay, uh, depends on who the one person is. That's an honest answer. That's an honest answer. I had somebody ask one time, are the five people, are they my in-laws? I actually had someone ask that. Um, maybe the five wanted to be there. No, they don't. They're just, they're just random strangers, just random strangers. All right, well, this is very interesting. Linda, what if there, was a, there was an interest, this is Laura. There was an interesting mm -hmm. comment that said, um, well, it depends. Would they already, were they going to die anyway? Ah, well, we're all going to die anyway, but no, right. they're not going to die anyway. So you got, you have five perfectly healthy strangers and another perfectly healthy stranger off on this side. So it's five or one and you don't have any emotional attachment to any of them. Oh, pull the lever and scream for the one person to move. You know what? Honestly, in 15 years, it's the first time I heard anyone said that. That's uh, I want to I want to be caught in this situation with you, Andrea. Okay. All right. So excellent. I appreciate your feedback. Now there are no right or wrong answers to this, but what this points out for us is this is um, you know this is a philosophical argument, right? An ancient philosophical argument. Do you? Um, do you act in a way that uh, is for the betterment of the larger majority of people, right? And it seems in this case, most of us would say it's a very difficult decision, but it's better to um, save five people and lose one than the other way around, right? So for the greater good, I'm gonna pull the lever, I'm gonna save five people. It's very hard, but this is what I'm gonna do. So that's what the majority of, of you are saying. So now let's take a look at the same scenario, but with a twist, all right? So you're on a footbridge and you're overlooking the track this time. And you see five people are tied on the track. The train is rushing toward them, but this time there's no lever. This time next to you is a very, very, very large person, very large man in this case. And if you push this man off of the bridge, you can save five people. 
if you don't push him off the bridge, those five people will die, will die. If you do push him off of the bridge, he will die. So same question. Do you push the one person to save the five? So see what you put that in your chat. Put that in your chat. <laughs> Wouldn't be able to push them over. Can't push them over. Don't push. I could never push the one person. Negligence versus murder. <laughs> oh, this guy's big, by the way. It, it, for those of you who might be a little bit older, there was a, um, a football player called the Refrigerator Perry on the Vikings in the 80s, I believe. Um, and uh, he's, he, he's big, built like a refrigerator. Couldn't push him. Oh, oh, he was a Bears. Okay, sorry. You know what? For Wisconsin, the Bears and the Vikings kind of, eh, you know. He was actually with the Eagles for a long time. Oh, he was. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. He got around for a big guy. Homicide versus an accident. Oh, Viking fan. <laughs> Get out of here. Um, who gets to decide? Fridge pair. Yeah, he was a giant football player. You wouldn't push. Um, you'd ask, you could not ask another to take the risk. Now, isn't this interesting? You couldn't push, but you could pull a lever. You know, throw yourself down. I should have warned you. Nice try, Molly, but you're not big enough. And it doesn't matter how big you are, Molly, you're not big enough. This scenario only works. If you push this guy over, oh, throw yourself down with him. Well, that's one way that you wouldn't have to deal with it, isn't it? One person versus five. It's very, this is interesting. Okay. So what I want to point out with this, are there people on the train? Oh, that's interesting. I have no idea. Pushing a lever versus pushing a real human renders me a little conflicted. Isn't that fascinating? So I'm going to leave it at that one for now, but I'm going to tell you something. What's the difference? Philosophically, ethically, what's the difference? You pull a lever, you kill one person, but you save five. You push a person, you save five, but you kill one person. The difference is pushing versus pulling a lever. The lever's an inanimate object, putting your hands on another human being and pushing them into risk, somehow for the majority of us is way more difficult. So this is where the flaw of the greater good really comes in because if it weren't just an ethical choice on the greater good, on doing what's right for the greater number of people, you would push the person. Now, I took a, an ethics class um, for about a year, I think it was four years ago, um, online through the University of Oxford, the fancy one in England. And um, I took a whole year worth of uh, philosophical ethics. And we had this, we had this uh, tr trolley problem. And I, I was like, oh, I'd push the person over like I hadn't. <laughs> I had no qualms about it. And that startled everybody that I was with in my class. And we had people from all over the world in that class. And I was the only one that said, you know, I would just push the person. I mean, sure, it would be awful. But if I couldn't jump myself into it, then, then I'd push the person to save five people. And I had all of my, the people in my cohort were asking me, why could you even think of doing that? I thought, well, he's probably just standing there having a good day thinking about what he's going to make for dinner, or whether he should go home and feed the dog. And maybe this is, this isn't a bad way to go to shove him off the bridge. And, you know, he doesn't have to die a slow, painful death and of, uh, you know, something in his old age and, and here five people can be saved and they can go on with their lives. It, it seemed pretty simple to me, which tells me one thing. It tells me that there is no one way of answering a question like this. We're all going to look at things differently, but it also tells me that our ethics are situational. Our ethics are situational. And that can be very problematic with ethical thinking, that it's situational. Um, 
if it were if we were always compelled to act in the greater good we would have just shoved the guy right off the bridge not that it wouldn't have been hard but we would have said oh that's a no-brainer because we're saving five people but our personal ethics and our professional ethics are situational which means when we're thinking yeah i think i'm more ethical than most or 61 percent of the doctors are thinking you're six or um Doctors are thinking 61% of them think that other doctors are less ethical than them. I have a feeling we don't really think of our ethics and our decision making on a very deep or clear level. And so we're going to do that today. So, all right. So ethics defined. Um, and I, uh, okay, let's see. How do I do this? I'm going to wait for, wait for a minute and then I have an app I need to turn off on my computer because I can see messages popping up. And that's all I need is for you guys to be reading those things. Okay, so, um, but ethics defined. So we're going to look at ethics in a couple of different ways. One is it's a set of moral principles or values. And then it's also the rules that govern us. So it's what we bring into the profession like me with my experience, my life experience, where I grew up in Wisconsin, where I've lived through my life, all of the things that make me, my family, everything else, um, I bring that to my job. Um, and then, and so do you. And there's no way we're all exactly alike. We do have some things in common. We all believe in the civil rights of people with disabilities. And then beyond that, when you start teasing things out, you probably find that there's a lot of variation and a lot of difference. And those differences are going to impact our ethical decision making, oftentimes when we're not aware of it. So we're going to be looking at that component as well as the uh, rules that govern us, like professional codes of standard, such as CRC. Now, our brains are awesome. I just, I think the human brain, oh my gosh, it's just so cool. But even cooler than that, let's just think of how awesome it is that we're alive. So regardless of, of where, you, where you believe the origins of humans are, go back as far as you think humans go. And understand that um, in that lineage, there, all of your ancestors had to live through childbirth, all of them had to live through childbirth, or at least enough to birth the people that ended up being you, right? You, if you think, and I don't wanna to get too weird here, it's before lunch and it's whatever, but if you think of just the sperm and egg thing, what are the odds just sperm and egg that you're alive? I mean, holy mackerel, there's, the, the odds are incredibly small. They, that that moment, that that day, that that partnership between your parents led to you, that by itself, then go all the way back to the beginning where um, pe your, the people that made you eventually had to be attractive enough to mate, had to live through childbirth, right? All the, and had to have that same sperm and egg moment all the way from the beginning to make you Wow, you are a miracle. You're an absolute miracle. We all are. It's unbelievable. Humans, humanity, the fact that we're alive today for even a moment, even in this difficult time of life, it is miraculous. It's unbelievable. And as humans, as miraculous as we are, as wonderful as we are, we're a bit flawed and that's okay. Our brains are tricky. Right? So our brains process 11 million bits of information per second in our unconscious brain. And our conscious brain works with about 40 bits per second. Now, what does that mean? That means that most of our decision making is made in our, in our unconscious brain. So those knee jerk reactions we have, um, oftentimes, you know, maybe we'll make a decision just kind of on the fly. Most of those kinds of decisions are made with our unconscious brain, um, which is fine unless we're working with a client and we're making important decisions. We need to move that thinking into our conscious brain. And you can see 11 million versus 40. 
that's a much slower mechanism, that conscious brain. So we need to bring that into our consciousness. Now, 11 million bits, what, is, what do those 11 million bits do? I'm sitting, at, I'm sitting at a table in my kitchen right now, and the 11 bits of information are telling me that there's no alligator running in here about to, you know, about to mess up my day. Um, the ceiling isn't currently falling in. If you've ever taken a step off of a curb and then jumped right back and went, whew, I didn't even see that coming. That was your, that was your, that was your um, unconscious brain taking care of you. It's always working to, to take in our surroundings, to take in our risk threat, to um, it's always one step, a couple steps faster than our conscious brain, right? But um, the conscious mind, the conscious mind is there. That's where our real thinking comes in. And it really works best when it has enough time. It's effortful, it's slow, it's controllable, and it's flexible. It's much harder for us to change um, our unconscious brain, our thinking in there, than it is to change our conscious brain. So our gut feelings come from our cognitive unconscious. Emergencies and threats come you know, are alerted to us from our cognitive um, unconscious, our deep emotions, um, our patterns that we develop through our lives often go into our cognitive unconscious. So we're really talking about a bit of a deficit here. And also, you know, a miracle. Can you imagine if, if we had to stop and think about every step we took? we'd be given the slotha run for its money as far as how slow we'd be moving. So our conscious brains are incredibly helpful and important. But for, but for thinking um, through ethical situations, we gotta be careful not to let that fall into that part of our brain. So how do we increase our success and make better decisions? And I, I got this through the University of um, Texas at Austin through their business department and I, I really love these four steps, and that's um, awareness, decision making, intent, and action. All right. So we start with ethical awareness. How often do you think about ethics? I'm guessing that you don't think about it very often. Some of you might. Uh, there's almost 200 people on this call. Some of you might. I think about it from a professional, um, a professional mindset, but also, you know, you can't study ethics as much as I have and not have it permeate your life as well. So um, it's, it's definitely in my frame of mind frequently. But one of the ways that we can raise ethics and bring it into our frame of, frame of mind, to bring it from our, to bring it, put it into our cognitive consciousness is to really think about ethics itself, being able to say, all right, what do I do in my job? What do I do in my life that has an ethical impact? And how can I be better at decision making? How can I take this from being a knee jerk reaction of right or wrong and really put it into um, something that I, that I tease over and try to find the, the implications of my decision making? How do I consult other people to broaden my, um, to, to broaden my experience of my own sense of ethics? So it's not just you, but guess what? I bet you've done at least, at least one of these. Lied to a stranger to get out of an awkward situation. Stolen something. Cheated at a game. Lied on a resume. Lied on your taxes. Called in sick when you weren't sick. Lied to a loved one to spare their feelings. Lied to a boss. Stolen a small office supply. Now, we tend to lie and cheat only up to a level that lets us still feel good about ourselves. But when I say it like that, don't you just feel a little, I don't know, a little greasy? <laughs> Wow, we all do that. We all lie and cheat up to a level that allows us to still feel good about ourselves, but we still all lie and cheat. Hmm, interesting. 
it's part of being human. So most, most of us think about ourselves as good and yet we still enjoy the benefits of acting unethically. We sometimes have different standards at work than we do at home. And in order to make uh, a conscious effort to be ethical, we have to be aware of ethics, especially during stressful times. So here's something you might not know. Under times of stress, we as humans tend to um, let our ethics go. And do you think we have any stress right now? I don't know about you, but I do. I don't like the pandemic. I don't like it a bit. Mm -mm. It stresses me out. I can't, I don't, this way of, of having to think about who you're interacting with, about not being able to hug the people that you love if they're not in your home, of having to wear a mask, of all the crazy, not being able to go to a restaurant and all the things that we used to do to de decompress. Children at home, um, working from home, just all of the changes that we've have to been resilient with. Well, guess what? That's making us stressed out. The way I think about it, you know, like my family's had some interactions with individuals lately. My husband was in a parking lot at Home Depot two weeks ago, and um, this woman was really frustrated by the way this other woman was parking. And she was flipping her off and just screaming and just all this stuff. And my husband was, you know, going like this, just like, calm down, calm down. Well, the woman who he was trying to do this calm down to rolled down her window and said, I hope you die. Now, that's not normal Wisconsin behavior. Not in my experience. Um, I think we all wake up. My new theory is we all wake up with a level three of stress and on a one to 10, some of us may be a two, some of us may be a five. And so a little extra stress doesn't take much before you're telling a stranger in a parking lot that you hope they die. Um, so I think we need to be a little kind to each other right now because we're a little more stressed. I think we need to be a little kinder to our clients right now, a little kinder to ourselves, a little kinder to our colleagues, because we're all under a little stress. And we also need to remember that at, during times of stress, we are more likely to behave unethically because, um, because in some ways it's easier. So there you go. Bet you didn't think of that. <laughs> I wish I could talk to you all. All right, so ethical decision making. We're going to have another opportunity to make an ethical decision. And here you get the um, opportunity to vote for the next world leader. And don't worry, it has nothing to do with actual elections. So everybody calm down. Um, but uh, this is, you only have three candidates to choose from, candidate A, B, and C. And candidate A associates with crooked politicians, consults astrologers, has had two mistresses, chain smokes up to 10 mar chain smokes up to 10 mar chain smokes and drinks up to 10 martinis a day. Candidate B was eject ejected from office twice, sleeps until noon, used opium in college, and drinks large amounts of whiskey every evening. And candidate C is a decorated war hero. He's a vegetarian, doesn't smoke drinks an occasional beer and hasn't had any extramarital affairs. Now, the thing I forgot to tell you is your vote, your one vote is going to decide who our next world leader is. So go ahead in the chat box and are you gonna go for candidate A, candidate B, or candidate C? Somebody said candidate B. I think we have someone who is a whiskey fan, couple. <laughs> A lot of C's, some B's, but mostly C's. One couple people say not enough info. I've seen three B's and one A. All right. Somebody says I don't trust candidate C. Never trust the vegetarian. Just kidding. Hey. <laughs> Just only joking. <laughs> Only joking. Leaning towards C, but not enough info. A lot of Bs. I really 
very few A's, but 90% of these are C's. Oh, C is uptight and hides his unethical behaviors. Whoo, you got that right. All right, I'm going to tell you. Some of you, I know, some of you have seen this Hitler question was before. Because Hitler was a vegetarian. I did not know that. Yes. Candidate C was Adolf Hitler. Um, using the chat, Linda, actually is a little more fun than the poll for this one. It is, isn't it? I think so, too. I think so, too. We got to see some really interesting comments. So candidate C was Hitler. So 90% of you, I'm guessing, voted C. So we are sunk. He's not, not a good candidate. Candidate B is Winston Churchill. So you're starting to see a World War II theme here, right? Winston Churchill had a, had, drank a lot of whiskey for sure. And then in the, in, the, um, in the vein of World War II, who do you think candidate A might be? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And yeah, that's a lot of martinis. Even, you know, I mean, today you get a martini and it looks like a, it, you could almost swim in it, right? But even in the 40s, when they were tiny, 10 is a lot of gin or vodka. It's a lot. And yes, I like the idea of C being a little too uptight. That <laughs> it certainly came out that way, didn't it? So what does this tell us about our decision making? Is that this is the kind of decision that, you know, it doesn't actually in real life here have, um, have that effect, thank goodness, where we just voted Hitler into office. But what we, what we do see is that we're going to oftentimes make decisions on very little information. And, you know, small decisions on very little information doesn't have that much impact. But when we're working with clients, our small decisions can actually have an enormous impact. Um, I'll give you an example here. So um, some of you might have heard this before. But my brother uh, was in VR services. He was hit by a car. I believe in 2017 and um, or 2016 and his he was crossing he was in a crosswalk and uh, somebody got frustrated waiting other cars had stopped and they got somebody behind got frustrated waiting at the cross so they zoomed up and they they hit my brother and he, he broke the windshield going over the car and his shoes were in front of the car when they found him and his he was in the back of the car he was hit he was hit pretty hard and he had a decent closed head injury um ended up with a pretty pretty significant case of post concussive syndrome anyway he ha he had a long recovery time till he could go to vr but he was about to lose everything he didn't have health insurance at the time his bills were hundreds of thousands of dollars and so he went to vr uh with the hopes of being able to get some work so he didn't lose everything he had and he goes to see the VR counselor for the first time now, like, like a lot of people with uh, disabilities and brain injury in particular, you can sometimes get hyper-focused on an appointment, right? Like I'd say, well, what are you doing this week? Well, I can't do anything Wednesday because Wednesday I have an appointment, right? So one appointment became, became hyper-focused on it. So he drove to um, the appointment and he had to take back roads because he couldn't drive more than 25 miles, like, you know, all the stuff that can happen after a hand injury. And he gets to his appointment an hour early and the VR counselor comes out, and this is in another state, by the way. And the VR counselor comes out and says, um, you're late. First thing she says, didn't, didn't bother to say hello, didn't bother to introduce herself, just came out and said, you're late. Second thing she said was, um, we work with people who want to get jobs. What if this were a job interview? I wouldn't hire you, right? And um, she went on like that for a moment or two. And then um, a counselor aide came out and said, by the way, this, this isn't the person you think it is. This guy's an hour early for his appointment. This, this, he's not late, he's an hour early. And the counselor just laughed it off and said, ha, 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 oh, sorry, I thought you were late. We can't stand having people who are late here. 
Well, that one decision, that one decision was probably to, to start out an interaction with my brother like that was probably made because she was stressed, burnt out, maybe had a lot of late people and you do have to set boundaries if you have a schedule, right? Absolutely you do. But the decision to interact with my brother in that way and set that kind of boundary with him without even introducing herself was an incredibly bad choice. After that appointment was over, I tried calling him for three days. He didn't answer his phone for three days. I was terribly worried. He was living in another state. And when he did answer, I said, he said, he said to me, is this, is this who I am now? Is this how people are going to treat me from now on? Am I less than a person? So your decisions and how you interact with people can have an enormous impact. He couldn't get out of bed for three days. That's why he didn't answer the phone. That one interaction had, had brought him from a moment of hope in thinking maybe he could turn his life around to one of devastation of thinking he's less than human. And that all happened because one person was burnt out and they made a very bad decision on how to set boundaries with somebody. Now setting boundaries, I'm a big believer in that, but not that way, okay? That's probably done out of stress. All right. Let's take a look at ethical intent. Meanwhile, if you have any questions, just put them up and I'm sure that uh, Laura will, will uh, let me know. Laura, Ashley, okay. All right. You go. Okay. So um, we all tend to lie a little and cheat a little, but like I said, but it only to the, um, only uh, to a level that allows us to keep our self image as reasonably honest individuals. In my level might be different than your level, might be different than somebody else's level, but we, as humans, we all do this. Like I'm, I think, okay, I'm, I'm going to lie and cheat only up to this amount and I'm still a good person. We don't think of that consciously, but we all have our internal levels. So most of us um, think of ourselves as good and still we enjoy acting unethically. Um, and we, uh, we rationalize our behavior. So Let's take a look at that self-serving bias, and then we'll talk about rationalizations. This is one of the things that I think in, I think this is one of the things that is really problematic in our country right now. You know, I grew up in Wisconsin, and um, I lived out in Seattle for about 16 years, 18 years, but I came back to Wisconsin because this is my home, right? And I remember growing up in northern Wisconsin, you know, I was raised that if somebody disagreed with you, you'd invite them over for a beer. That's the way my parents taught me. And you'd have, you'd, you'd talk it over and you'd agree to disagree. And that's just the way it was. Things are quite different. Everybody talks about how polarized things are right now. In, in our country, in our world, um, and I blame the self-serving bias. Now, what is that? Now, remember, we're magnificent. I think, I think the, we're all miracles. Each and every one of you out there is a miracle, all right? And we all have this flaw. When we hear something that we agree with, a part of our brain center will actually light up to tell us that we're correct and that that can, then that conclusion advances our self-interest. So what I mean by that is if I hear something that I believe to be immediately correct without proof or anything, but I just, it feels right, right? I believe it. The part of my brain that sends out serotonin and gives me those nice feelings, right? is going to light up and say, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing, right? That's a problem. Especially when we, uh, we have the technology and the ability to find information that already agrees with us. Right? So I can go find, um, whether I'm on Facebook, whether I'm on uh, looking at the news, I'm, it's harder. I try to, I have, I don't watch TV, but I, and I try to get news from as many different 
sources as possible to try to balance things out. Um, and it's difficult. And some days I just want to throw some of that stuff, just, just throw my computer against the wall because it's very hard to sift through different things, but I think it's really important. What I want to do is just settle into the kind of news I want to hear and just stick with that because it's going to keep lighting up the pleasure centers in my brain. And the more we do that, I think the more polarized we get. I really think that that's part of the problem. And now I'm going to give you an example that is absolutely, we're going to talk baby corn here. So I had, I was having dinner with some friends and we were having some Asian takeout food. And I, I think it might've been Thai food and it comes with baby corn. Now there's very few things in this world that I will not eat. But I personally think that baby corn, I mean, it's just, oh, just looking at it on the screen. It's just, it's, that's not corn. <laughs> Come on, people. We know what corn is. You, corn is, you know, no, 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 no. That's corn. What the heck is this stuff? It's, you eat the, the middle of it's all squishy. It's squishy. It feels like something's licking you back when you try to eat it. And what's up with that flavor? It, does, it has a weird, weird, weird flavor. It doesn't taste like corn. And what do you think? It grows on tiny husks and people with great manual dexterity husk it. I mean, it's not corn. So as I was sitting at the table, um, a friend of mine who's a doctor, I said, God, I can't stand baby corn. I don't even understand what it is. I don't think it's a food. And she looked at me and in all seriousness, because she believed this, she said, it's not food, it's grown in a Petri dish. And I said, of course it is. <laughs> of course it's grown in a Petri dish, that explains it. That explains it, it's so gross, it's grown in the dish. Ugh. And the other people sitting at the table just kind of shook their heads and they got out their phones and they were like, baby corn, you know, looking for that, looking for the answers. And to my surprise, baby corn is also known as a cornlet. It's a cereal grain taken from the corn harvested early. So when the stalks are still small, so the stalks are small, when it first gets a silk on the top, they harvest it and they just cut the top of the corn off. That's baby corn. But um, I was willing and ready to completely embrace the thought that this was grown on in a petri dish no problem at all because that made sense i felt validated and vindicated and and all of those things because baby corn is so disgusting of course it's grown in a petri dish with bacteria and other disgusting things right nope nope this is what it is so this is an example that i wanted to just show you of how, now baby corn, it wasn't that important. I didn't work for the baby corn council or anything, so uh, having a misunderstanding, but I wanted to just show you how easy it is. I believed because A, the person who told me was an authority. She was a doctor. She might not have been a doctor of corn, but she was a doctor. And secondly, it fit with everything I believed in how disgusting this stuff is, right? So, um, yeah, I was willing to sign up. Now my friends weren't, and they, they taught me the, the errors of my brain, uh, which is fine. It's still disgusting, but there you go, there's baby corn. So if we can do this with something like baby corn, if we can do something like this with other things that maybe aren't that important, how many times do we do this in our lives when it's, um, when it's something that is important, how many times do we hear something and we take it to be truth because the pleasure centers in our brain light up because we automatically agree with it. And I think personally, I, I hope someday we go back to the Wisconsin that I grew up in where regardless of what you believe, you know, um, we're all Wisconsinites. <laughs> We're all, we all live in the, in the mitten, right? Uh, I, I think it's a pretty cool thing. All right, so let's take a look now. Any questions so far? Any questions? None that I'm seeing. There's all right. Lots of good comments about baby corn. Oh, well, you keep them to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> ah. 
<laughs> all right. No, I, we're all welcome under the same tent. Baby corn lovers, non-baby corn lovers, come on. We're all welcome under the same tent. Just stay five feet away. Um, no, kidding. No, really, the smell. Okay. So here's an example of how um, sometimes our biases can come in and impact how we're working with clients. Here's Katie. She's been working with Ben for a year. He has traumatic brain injury and partial, partial blindness from an orbital, orbital blowout fractures. And Ben experiences emotional outbursts secondaries to the brain injury. As you know, if you get a frontal lobal brain injury, and those are really common, those frontal lobal ones. And that is another design flaw of the human body. I have to say, this thing functions magnificently well, um, but uh, that design on the inside of the brain, on the inside of the skull, where right inside the front of our skull, we have these bony ridges. So if you get hit even on the back of the head, um, our brains float a little bit in the fluid. If you get hit hard enough, that brain slaps up against those bony ridges. It, be nice if it was nice and smooth in there. I don't really understand why they're, they're bony like that because that's where the brain hits. That's where that bruising can happen. And a lot of our emotional content is up there. So, um, you know, you, we've probably, you've probably, if you've been in the field for a little while, you've met people with brain injuries that, that can have a very uh, dramatic change in personality. I knew someone that was uh, a hardened criminal um, and then he was in a motorcycle accident and he became one of the most loving people you could ever meet. So it was a, it was a, and then I've seen the opposite. I knew a lawyer who fell down a, a group of stairs or a, a flight of stairs and um, he became the most irrational and difficult person to talk to um, because of that brain injury, right? So here we have Ben, he has a brain injury. He's hard to work with. Katie hasn't heard from Ben in two weeks and she knows she could send him a letter. Um, she knows she should call him, but she decides to send him a letter because Ben's been getting all of these government letters and these letters from that he just doesn't open because he can barely understand them at this point. And she's hoping that he'll just go away. Well, now she's not technically to the letter of the law doing anything unle unethical because she could she could send a letter, but what she is doing is she's acting in her own best interest, her own self-interest, and she's doing so maybe out of stress. Um, it truly, Ben is irritating to work with, so he's difficult, um, but this is part of his disability. This is the work that she's in, but this is how she is rationalizing her behavior of being able to say, well, I sent him a letter, so I don't see what the problem is. That's another area that us humans tend to fall a little bit short, where it's really important for us to have a certain awareness. And that's, um, that really is our, our capacity to rationalize. Now, some of you have seen this before. If you've ever been in one of my in-person trainings, this is a lovely picture of blueberry pie. And man, that looks really good right now. I'm getting hungry. I don't know about you. But that, uh, and so I like to think of rationalizations as the second piece of pie argument. Now let's imagine that this pie, this pie that's on your computer screen is something that you could, I could actually just give you right now. Here, have a, have a piece of blueberry pie. And maybe you don't like blueberries, maybe it's a baby corn pie to those of you who are standing up for baby corn. <laughs> but just imagine it's your favorite dessert of, or favorite meal of whatever you want and, and we're able to just have it. And you just had a big breakfast and you're like, I'm about to eat lunch. This is calories I shouldn't have, but I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm just going to do it. And you're going to think of all the reasons that you deserve the pie. So what are some of the reasons that you deserve that piece of blueberry pie right now? More pie, vote more pie, yummo, banana cream is better. <laughs> well, then that can be banana cream. I'll work out later. Absolutely. That's something I frequently say. I'm stressed out. This will help. Life is short. Why not enjoy life? Exactly. What else might you say? No reason. Just eat more pie. <laughs> I just lost five pounds recently. There's fruit in there. Oh, blueberries are good for you. They're full of antioxidants. I'll probably live forever eating that pie. 
I ate salad all week. Oh man, if that was actually true, I would eat the pie. More pie, I'll walk later. Not <laughs> a treat every once in a while. Banana cream. I already had uh, uh, I already had a bad breakfast, so I might as well. <laughs> I already ate breakfast. I've been good lately. Mm -hmm. All of these are excellent rationalizations, and rationalizations help us do the things that we might not otherwise do, and that that can make life better. I mean, you know what? Occasionally, a piece of blueberry pie is absolutely the way to go, or banana cream. You might not know when you're going to have the chance to get another piece that's delicious. I get it. I get it. Um, it's a golden opportunity, right? Oh, these are rationalizations, and they allow us to take risks and chances that we might not otherwise do if we couldn't rationalize them. For example, jumping out of an airplane. If you've ever jumped out of a perfectly good functioning airplane, you had to rationalize that because there's there I undoubtedly there were parts of your brain that are very smart that were saying this is a perfectly good functioning airplane. If you jump out, it's you know it might not be your best choice, but you had to overcome that and say something like, well, it, it, you know I if if I if I do jump and if I were to die right now, at least I'd do it on doing something incredibly exciting or it's worth the fear, it's worth the risk. You had to rationalize that somehow. Being with certain people, sometimes you had to rationalize that, right? Um, so rationalizations are not always a difficult or bad thing, but they are so common that they can really get in our way. And um, because we rationalize so often, we don't often know we're doing it. So here's an example of, uh, example of some common rationalizations. Like if it's necessary, it's ethical. I was just doing it for you. I'm just fighting fire with fire. It doesn't hurt anyone. So let's try, um, I was just doing it for you. So uh, let's say, let's say I decide to, um, cheat on my case notes because my supervisor told me I had to get them ready and I decided I'd just cheat on them and do a lot of cutting and pasting, kind of catch up that way. Well, I could just look at it and say, well, I was just doing that for you, you know. Um, I'm just fighting fire with fire. That one's particularly dangerous. That example of the, the counselor that interacted with my brother, I think she was fighting fire with fire on that one if she were to break down her rationalizations. She could see that somebody was, you know, misbehaving. And so she was going to um, uh, punish him verbally for that, right? Work another example of that one. That one is so dangerous. I'm just fighting fire with fire. If you think of um, maybe you're working with somebody who is, who is very persistent and maybe a little too persistent and you decide to put them at the bottom of the pile of things to do, or a phone call comes in and you decide to put them off for two days because they're just, they're difficult to work with. I'm just fighting fire with fire. It doesn't hurt anyone, you know, maybe taking a gift. Uh, everyone's doing it. Everybody's leaving Fridays early. Everybody's taking a long lunch. It's okay if I don't gain personally. I really like this client, so I'm gonna give them some extra stuff. Um, and it's okay because I'm not gaining personally. I've got it coming. Now there's a great one for taking extra long lunches or you know, uh, any of the other little perks we could uh, talk ourselves into you got it coming for. I can still be objective working with someone you know. Um, it's just this once. That can, that can get a, rid of a lot of our shames, can't it? If you can just say, well, it's just this once, just this once. So we rationalize. Rationalizations, again, aren't always bad. But the, I'll tell you what. Here's the thing. What is, what is the worst ethical violation a person can commit with a client? Put it in, your, put it in the chat for a second. What do you think is the worst thing a person can do murder. I think that is probably correct. What would having sex? It's funny, murder never comes first. Um, breaching, yes, grooming people for sexual uh, favors, harming someone, rape, yes, all of these things. Yes, 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 perfect. 
Um, steal their identity. Well, I never thought of that one. Manipulation. So when we think personal relationship, yes, overlooking fraud because you eat their parents. <laughs> what are you, a zombie, Molly? Um, <laughs> not that I have anything against zombies. <laughs> You're all welcome under my tent. But holy moly, eat their parents. Okay, so um, I'm going to close this for a minute. Uh, so typically we think of the sexual relationship, right? Although I do think murder is worse. Um, and Linda, you know. we, we have an interesting comment in the Q and A. Yeah. And basically they're saying anything that the person that you violated feels it is. Oh, that's such a good, yeah, that's a good. Yeah. It's their, per, whatever they're perceiving is that violation. Well, I have to agree with that. Right. Cause everybody's everybody's range is different right everybody's range is different we're we're being respectful that's very very well said all right so but if we think of the one that uh, most people most often think of which is sex right so um let's see the do, how many how many professionals do you think wake up in the morning and go oh you know, not a lot to do today i maybe i'll sleep with someone that I work for, right? No, that, that, that isn't the way these things happen. The way it happens with these really um, kind of egregious ethics violations is they happen one small rationalization at a time. One small rationalization at a time. So if you were, and you know, with CRC, with the, um, every year somebody is ending up getting fired or losing their license from having sexual relationships with the client. It happens all the time. Well, how can it happen? Well, it happens again with one tiny rationalization building on another. No one gets up and just says, you know what, I think I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do this thing and it's, I'm gonna do it on purpose and I'm just gonna do it and I don't care. That doesn't happen. What happens is a person meets with the client for the first time and they're like, wow, I feel, I feel a bit of an attraction, but I can handle it. And then they meet maybe, um, more frequently, well, the person needs the additional service. And then you meet a little later in the day, well, it better, it's better for their schedule. And then you give them a ride home and you say, well, I can still handle my feelings. And then as you're approaching something um, that gets to be closer to the violation of having a sexual relationship, and you're already in violation by going this far, um, but if you, get to that point, then it's like, well, you know, you could hear somebody saying, well, people are, people meet each other in different places and love is love. And this shouldn't, I shouldn't be held back from my feelings that are mutual with this person, if this is how I feel, right? So the rationalizations are built upon each other. And any one of them, if you were to, to dissect them and look at any one rationalization, they're not that bad. They're tiny but it, they pile up upon one another to become a giant rationalization. And I think this happens, you know, like uh, a lot of times people, um, they commit crimes. If you were to, especially, especially white collar crimes of um, like embezzlement and so forth. If you were to talk to the person and break it down, it starts with these rationalizations. Oh, they're not going to miss this, or I can put the money back or, you know, blah, blah, blah. It starts with these rationalizations. And next thing you know, you've committed a federal crime. So rationalizations really do impact us. And when it comes to ethics, it, we all really have to know that we rationalize and what those rationalizations are. Okay. So let's turn ethical intent into ethical action and add a little morality to this. So if you think of a rationalization um, such as uh, I'm just fighting fire with fire. So let's take that one and say you've got a client who calls up and he's really angry or she's really angry or they're really angry and they're um, maybe yelling and using some profanity or something. And you decide right then, well, that's just it. I'm I'm going to call back and I'm going to yell and use profanity too. So the first question to ask when you're thinking of a, um, when you're thinking of rationalizing your behavior 
bring it into your consciousness, get it out of that cognitive unconscious, bring it into that consciousness and say to yourself, how would I feel telling a colleague or supervisor about this? So I can think about that. How would I feel telling a colleague or supervisor about the fact I'm about to call up and yell and swear at one of my clients? What if this is something that everyone did? Well, that would probably be the breakdown of our profession, wouldn't it? Do I believe people should be treating, treated as an end in themselves? And if I do, how does this decision reflect my belief? What that means is this client, uh, the way I like to think of it, is this client a person or are they part of my job, right? Are they a means to an end, which is my paycheck and my job and getting successful closures or getting this, um, you know, whatever uh, works for a successful um, interaction with the client. Am I going for that? Or is the person a person in themselves? Now, that should break down your rationalization, right? If you feel like you could pick up the phone and just call the person and say, I'm just fighting fire with fire. I'm going to give back to them just as good as they gave to me. If you feel okay telling a supervisor about that, hey, guess what? I'm going to call. I'm going to call and I'm going to swear and stuff. And if you feel okay about that, then you're probably going to do it no matter what. But these pieces are in there to help break those rationalizations, to give us a little breathing spot between our thoughts and our actions. Because between our thoughts and our actions lie our ethics. You can have as many bad thoughts as you want. It's human. When that person calls up and they're like, wah, 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 I can't stand you. Wah, 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 wah. You can have as many thoughts as you want. Feel free. That's your brain. That's but between your thoughts and your actions lie your ethics. And this is where we want to break it down and become better, right? Because the profession that we're in, regardless of what actual job you do, the profession that we're in is part of something that is much greater than any of us as individuals. And that's the civil rights of people with disabilities. And everyone on this call should be proud to be part of that. It's kind of a big deal. It's a really big deal, actually. It's a super big deal. So this is bigger than us. And in this way, um, hopefully that helps us keep on track with our ethics. All right. So between your thoughts and your actions, try throwing in a little morality. Try throwing in, how would I feel telling a colleague supervisor about this? Or what if this is something everyone did? Or am I treating this person as part of my job? Or as a person with value of their own, right? All right. So when it comes to ethical decision making, we need to remember that we're probably thinking of our own needs first, especially during times of stress. That we want to listen to our gut, but does it agree with our head? If so, are our gut feelings rational? Because our gut feelings are coming from, from our cognitive unconscious, right? And sometimes they're dead on. And sometimes less so. We want to review the code of conduct that we have for our, um, our profession. Consult with someone you trust. I do this one a lot. I consult frequently um, because I have my own set of references, right? I have my own experience, my own set of references, my own knowledge, my own education. But if I turn to somebody else and, and work something through with them, I'm getting their whole um, experience, their whole set of values, their whole set of education, right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to have a different flavor to things. And I find that invaluable. So consult with someone you trust, not with someone you necessarily think is going to agree with you. No, 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 no. Try to find somebody that you trust with and maybe even have, might have a different point of view. Okay, between our thoughts and our actions lie our ethics. And now we're going to move on to boundaries. So before we move on to boundaries, any questions so far? And I'm going to sneak off the camera just for one second. Hang on. I'll be right back. I'm not going far. Not going far. Okay, and I, there was only one question so far that I did answer, which was someone asked, what is the CRC Code of Ethics? Oh, that's so a good question. I answered it in the Q&A, but I will also put the link 
in the chat for everyone. Awesome. Yeah. Forgive me. I'm starting to get a migraine, so I'm going to need to take my medicine. Da, 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 da. Or I'll be miserable for the rest of the day. Voila. Thank you, modern medicine. All right. Yeah. So the CRC code of ethics, for those of you who don't know, so it's the Certified Rehabilitation uh, Counselor Code of Ethics. But whether you're a rehab counselor or not, it's also a nice umbrella code for kind of our whole profession. Each one of you, you know, maybe you follow the codes under APSI, maybe under um, uh, ACA. You know, uh, our professions are defined a profession has a code of ethics, right? It, um, so you have your own code of ethics. You probably have some codes of conduct in your, for whatever um, organization you work for. CRC code of ethics is just the rehab counseling code of ethics. So that's that. All right. And it, but it tends to, tends to look a lot like the American Counseling Association code of ethics, except it's rehab centered. All right, so boundaries. Let's take a look at boundaries because this is a big one. How many of you in the chat work, work uh, do have a lot of direct contact with clients? Oh, migraines aren't fun. Thank you for saying so. They are not. 90% of the time, okay. All right. Who else works directly with contact? Direct content, 80% or a lot? Okay, cool. Um, depends on COVID or not. Yep. That does make a difference, doesn't it? Awesome. 50%, 85%. Okay. 0% due to COVID. Ugh, COVID's really messing us up, isn't it? Direct contact most of the time. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and the many jobs that I've had in my life, I was a... Uh, um, a couple of jobs where I had a lot of direct contact. I was a teacher for people with disabilities, for um, developmental uh, intellectual disabilities and also um, traumatic brain injury. And then I was a clinical case manager. Um, and that was the most direct service job I've ever had. Um, it was going into people's homes and, and um, taking people to appointments and to the hospitals and so on and so forth. That was very direct service. So I really understand the difference in boundaries in our profession between whether you're sitting like VR counselors tend to sit behind a desk and have their clients come in. I was a VR counselor also. Um, and then the other direct service uh, that comes with working with people on job sites, come with working with people directly on resume, you know, working um, um, in, uh, you know, the workshop thing is, is much different now because of WIOA, but um, you know, working with people uh, to uh, supporting them in jobs and so on and so forth. There's a lot of direct service that goes on with the people that I know I'm talking to. So boundaries, I think this is the, besides the fact we need to think about thinking and how our thinking impacts other people, this is the next thing, which is boundaries. It was, was, it's a lot easier to sit behind a desk and look at a client and talk to them and maintain boundaries than it is if you're standing in their home. Or if you're standing next to them in the grocery store and you're helping them stock an aisle, right? Um, it's, it, the boundaries are very, very different from one, one type of job to another. So let's take a look. Now, I like, this is a nice Midwest mallard here. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. And um, I think that that is really true for us as professionals when we work with our clients. How many people do you ask, um, do you talk to about your hopes and dreams? How many people do you talk to about your barriers? How many people do you talk to about the things that are kind of intimate in your life, like um, your financial status or um, your health, right? We tend to talk to people who are our friends or our relatives or our partners. Those are the people that we talk to 
about these things. And then in walk you, right? With whatever, whatever job you're doing, you're reflecting friendship. Your kindness is reflecting friendship. And if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck unless we put, unless we let people know I'm not a duck, <laughs> right? I think that's where one of the biggest failings is, and it's it's nobody's fault. Oh, hey, we're all in the Midwest here, so um, we don't like conflict in the Midwest, at least not in the part of the Midwest I'm used to. And um, so, you know, setting boundaries can be uncomfortable. But I'll tell you what's way worse than setting boundaries and the discomfort of that. It's not having them. It's being at the point of your job where you're well, uh, ready to move on to a different position and you have all your clients ask for your phone number because they expect that you're gonna hang out with them after you're done with the job, right? It's having someone say, well, why, don't, why, can't, you, why can't you take this Christmas present? It's having someone say, well, how come I can't come over to your house and meet with you there? If you can come over to my house, why can't I come to your house? It's all of those things that happen um, because if it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck, it's a duck. I personally think that the best thing that we can do for people is to educate them. That the power and control that we have over the people that we work with can be really leveled out and even if everybody understands why everybody's there and what, what our roles mean to each other. You know, to be able to say, I'm here to support you and I'm, I'm here to help you, to help you achieve, your, achieve your dreams. And here's, the, here's what I'm gonna do and here's what you're gonna do and here's what we're gonna do together. And this is what this relationship means and it's a professional relationship. Um, I didn't do that at first when I was younger. I didn't, I didn't know any better. And I was in some very uh, intimate types of scenarios with people when I was a case manager, you know, helping them during very difficult times in their lives and in difficult situations. And I learned the hard way when I went to move to another job that um, when people were saying, well, what do you mean? You were only my friend because you got paid. I mean, that was... That was horrible. Why did I do that? Why did I get myself in that situation? Why wasn't I just honest up front? And it really helped from then on being able to say, these are the people who are your, these are, these are your support system. These are your friends. These are, this is your professional support system, right? And they're different. And this is why. That education allowed people to, to kind of flourish within both roles right? Being able to understand who their friends were and flourish in that world and being un uh, able to understand their professional supports and why, why that's different. So, um, so we are the organization. So it also, um, let me take a look here. It's how we approach things so we, we're, approach, we're approaching in 2020, we should all be approaching the civil rights of people with disabilities and working with people with disabilities in a mode of empowerment. We're moving from an assumption of people with disabilities need to be taken care of. That's old school, that's really old school, but we still hear that a lot. To people with disabilities should direct the course of their own lives. That's where we are today. That's where we should be. That's where we should be moving forward. Um, Behavior decisions are made for consumers, not by consumers. We know that isn't the case anymore. Decisions are person-centered. That the right of the consumer um, to be autonomous is violated is the ethical impact of these assumptions. And the impact of our assumptions are that people should direct the course of their own lives and that decisions should be person-centered is that they have the right uh, to be autonomous, right? Now this during times of stress can also be difficult. It's easy to fall back into old medical model patterns. Um, but as, as people active in the pursuit of civil rights for people with disabilities, we definitely are in the second column right now. So poor boundaries versus ethical boundaries. 
It's tempting sometimes to give our consumers money, to want to give them money. Uh, bringing consumers to our home, purchasing gifts for the people that we work for, having inappropriate sexual or non-physical or non-sexual physical contact. Um, where our ethical boundaries, the the strong ethical boundaries instead are assisting the person with employment of their choice, aiding the person to discover a social network, um, providing genuine affirmations to the client to build confidence, and setting respectful boundaries. Now, I know you know this, but we go over it again because at these... Um, because at these moments when you do have a chance to go back and talk and think about ethics, I think this is a good time for us to all recenter. recenter. The busy you, you, busier you are, the more stressful things get, the easier it is to kind of forget these things, right? So we're bringing them back and some of you are like, I can't believe she's even talking about that, that's so basic. And some of you might be thinking to yourself, well, of course I bring some of my consumers home. They're otherwise lonely. Well, I would say in, uh, in an effort to promote the civil rights of people with disabilities, we help people find their own social network. Okay, let's move on. So now we're going to talk about dual relationships. There's different types of dual relationships. We have, um, first of all, what do you think a dual relationship might be? Let's put that up in the chat. What do you think a dual relationship might be? Counseling family. Yep, that would be a dual relationship. So counseling both the individual and the family. Uh, working with a friend's family member. Yes. Knowing the person before working with them. Yes. Knowing someone from your community. Yes. In small communities, dual relationships are very hard to avoid. They sure are. Being a person's counselor and also your plumber. Yeah. Having a side business when uh, being in a side business when they're your customer. Yes. Mutual friends, seeing people at a social event, absolutely. All of these are different types of dual relationships. Now, sometimes dual relationships, yep, playing two roles with the client, that narrows it right down to the essentials. It's, it's knowing people in both a personal and private role of some kind or, or two professional roles that are different. All right, so let's think about dual relationships. Now, sometimes they can't be avoided. We're gonna talk about what to do if they can't be avoided. But there are different types of dual relationships. So let's start with that. There's voluntary, which is entering into a dual relationship with intention. Now, these should be, we should always try to stay away from voluntary dual relationships. Okay, because remember how complicated friendships are? We just talked about that with the last slide. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, Clients, adult, adult learners, clients are going to look at us and they're going to say, oh, this person is kind. This person is here. This person is helping me. Therefore, this person is a friend. That's what adult learners do. They take what they know and they attach something new to it. And that's why we always look like friends until we make those boundaries clear, right? It's normal. But we're, we're empowering people by giving them the information they need to be able to discern our actual relationship. Well, voluntary relationships really should be avoided if possible. And we'll get, because of how complex it is for people to understand our roles in the first place. Unavoidable dual relationships that occur in small communities or with special populations. When I was working out in Seattle, you know, there was a very big population there of people. But um, for example, people who lived and worked in the deaf community, that was a small population within a larger population, right? But counselors or um, other professionals who are deaf might hang out with other people who are deaf in as if they used um, ASL in particular because they wanted to hang out with people that spoke their language, right? So you can have a small community within a very large community people with language similarities, with cultural similarities, with disability similarities, whatever it is, um, people can develop special populations or small communities, even within larger communities. And then of course, most of Wisconsin is fairly rural. 
So you're going to have small areas where you're working with people that you may know. Unexpected, finding yourself in a dual relationship that you hadn't anticipated. Maybe you go to um, uh, a committee and you've been asked to be on a committee. You show up and one of your clients is on the committee. That would be an unexpected dual relationship. And then there's levels of intensity. So shopping at the same store, children going to the same school, that's a low level of intensity. That's if you see a client, you can deal with that you know, not to go up and talk to them and ask them about, you know, stuff. If they approach you, you can address them, that kind of thing. That's just courtesy, common courtesy. Excuse me, a medium level of intensity would be meeting at church or marching at the same political rally, those kinds of things. And why I say that's medium instead of low, why it's slightly heightened, is let's say you go to the same church. Well, now you both know um, more about each other personally, don't you? Because faith actually tells a lot about a person. Same is true if you went to a political rally together. Or not together, but if you saw each other at a political rally, you would know a lot more about each other. Hi, so serving on a committee together, playing on a re recreational league, that has a higher level of intensity, right? So there's different types of dual relationships and there's different levels of intensity with those dual relationships. Now, sometimes we can have what's called a boundary crossing and, or a boundary violation. Now, boundary crossing, keeping in mind, you know, you want to avoid dual relationships if possible because of how complex they can be. But a boundary crossing would be attending a ceremony sharing a little personal information. Maybe you have a child that has a disability and you're working with a transition student and you decided a small amount of personal information um, might be worthwhile to the individual. Uh, not going on and on and making it about you or about your child, but just sharing a small amount. Purchasing a product from a client. This can be really controversial depending on where you work, um, but uh, it may be okay, it may be a boundary crossing or accepting a small gift. Any of these boundary crossings, make sure that you check with your agency to find out what the rules are around that. A violation would be um, taking things further. So instead of attending a ceremony, being the client's best man, right? Uh, dating or a sexual relationship, of course, that's a violation. Giving, giving someone money, uh, taking things of value from the client or violating their confidentiality. So boundary crossings versus boundary violations. Now, hopefully what I've showed you here is that if you find boundaries difficult, well, that's because they're very complicated. And clients are going to look at us and, and narrow us down to the common simple denominator, which is probably... If, if walks like a duck and talks like a duck, then we're acting like friends, we're friends, right? So we set those boundaries and then we do our best to avoid intentional um, uh, boundary, boundary uh, 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 excuse me, now the medication's kicking in. Woo! Um, intentional voluntary dual relationships, we try to um, avoid those, all right? And we just need to be aware about uh, with our boundaries. Small communities are especially difficult, but there are situations even in large communities where you're just going to be, you're gonna run across um, an opportunity to work with someone you know, and being able to just self, um, you know, what, what is in my client's best interest here? What is in my best interest? Talk, talk this over with someone who doesn't have these, um, uh, who can have a, a clean perspective, right? Consult with someone. All right. Always ask these questions. Is this in my client's best interest? Not in yours, but your client's. Whose needs are being served? Are they yours or the client's? Will this have an impact on the service you're delivering? How would you feel telling a colleague about this? And am I comfortable in documenting this decision in a file? All right, this should help you with your boundaries. Am I violating a code of ethics or code of conduct for my agency? All right, and how do we set boundaries? 
you know, we set them clearly, respectfully, upfront in a way that the client understands and repeat it as often as possible. I worked with this one guy. Oh my gosh, he was just awesome. His name was Steven. And he had um, come to me as a, uh, as a client after he tried to kill himself. He had been put in a nursing home. He had obtained a traumatic brain injury in a motorcycle accident and his disabilities were uh, too severe to be put back out in the community. So he was kept in a nursing home for a while and, and tried to kill himself twice. So then he was put out in the community. And um, with, a, with a, a case manager, I was his case manager at the time. And I remember he would come and talk to me and he would, his nose would almost be touching my nose. And I would say, Stephen, I'm gonna put my, hands on your shoulders and um, I'm going to show you where is most appropriate to stand when you're talking to somebody. And I'd move him back and a few seconds later he'd be right here and I'd move him back. A few seconds later he'd be right here and I'd move him back. Um, eventually that information was able to make it into his long-term memory. And it, it, took, it took a couple months I think for that to, to, for that to work out. And the reason I mention that is that physical boundary and being able to say, okay, I'm going to take my hands and I'm going to put them on your shoulders and I'm going to move you into a place, you know, where if I hadn't have done that and kept exercising that physical boundary with him, that ended up being his number one barrier, not just to employment, but it was this barrier to um, interacting with strangers. He'd go into a grocery store before he learned not to stand there. And he would go into a grocery store and he would walk right up to a clerk and stand really very within an inch of their nose. And that was making people really uncomfortable. And parents, it, it, you know, would grab their children away if he tried to talk to their children because he was too close. It was just a community sense of discomfort. And the number one thing I did for him was that. We also had lots of talks about, you know, um, boundaries around, I don't know, he always wanted me to, next time can we meet in the hot tub? <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. But, um, but giving him that sense of boundaries that he had lost during the accident was the number one thing that helped him. After that, within a few months, he had a girlfriend, he had a job, um, he could go move through the community, people started to really get to know him and the character that he was and really get to appreciate him. But it, it had to do with those physical and emotional boundaries that I, I had to set with him. And in some ways, my Wisconsin self would have, was very uncomfortable um, creating those. But I'll tell you, after doing it a hundred times, it gets easy. <laughs> All right. So it's our responsibility to share boundaries with the clients. It's not theirs. We can't assume people understand because you're a working professional that, um, that they understand the boundaries. That's unrealistic thinking on our part. It's our responsibility to explain it. Dual relationships should be avoided because they're complicated, they're confusing, especially for the client. It's our responsibility to elicit empowerment. And if physical contact is ever to um, happen, um, everybody should know why. <laughs> and the real boundaries of the situation should be doing, known. Now that doesn't mean that if a client isn't crying that occasionally, you know, you might touch their arm or some clients want a hug or whatever. All of that needs, you need to, everybody needs to be clear on what the boundaries are when that happens. Or it can be inviting a whole bunch of heartbreak down the road. Okay, we talked about uh, small communities. One of the other ways that small communities can be challenging with boundaries is confidentiality. Um, you run into people all the time. How do you maintain that? Physical surroundings, we're seeing each other pre-COVID. We were seeing each other more in the community. Um, main, making sure that if we're meeting someone outside that other people can't hear what we're talking about. Family involvement, we want to encourage family involvement in, in many, in, with many of our clients, but that can lead to special um, confidentiality concerns. 
Special populations, maybe you're working with someone with a more significant disability and you're working with a guardian. Duty to report, that would be the one time that we're allowed to violate our confidentiality and that's when there's danger to self or others. Record keeping and convenience record keeping, we wanna make sure if we're keeping records on tablets or, or uh, laptops that we keep that information safe. And convenience, convenience is, um, you know, sometimes it's just easier to breach confidentiality. Uh, it doesn't ever make it right. So convenience is a trigger for a lot of us though. If I could just get this, if I could just tell this job developer and not get a release, this is gonna move a lot faster. That's a great example. And then boundaries at a distance. Now we're in a whole new world of working with people online. Um, how do we maintain our boundaries at a distance? What do we do with social media and so forth? We remember that ethics is what happens when no one is looking. So we are more autonomous than we've ever been in our lives right now. Um, Working with individuals, if we're working with them online, we wanna make sure that we're working in an application that's secure. We wanna make sure that we're meeting with people and that they understand the limits of confidentiality when we meet with them virtually. We wanna make sure that when we're meeting with people virtually that it's accessible and that it's the best source of meeting with them, which is better to meet with them on um, FaceTime, is it better to use Zoom? Is it better to uh, text with individuals? Is it better to email? You know, the number one complaint that goes to um, uh, client assistance programs right now is that, is that we as professionals are taking too long to respond to people. And I think a big part of that is not that we're taking any longer to respond than we ever have before, but because so much of our communication is instantaneous these days. Like if you text somebody, there's a good chance you're gonna stay there with your phone and wait to see the response. You expect it to be immediate. If a client leaves a message for you and you haven't, you haven't, you haven't told them, it could be 24 hours till I respond. If they leave you an email message do they leave you an email message, a phone message, a text message? How do, how do they contact you, right? It's really, it's important for you to have a standard um, that you use working with people that you can relay to them and make sure that within, within those that you understand the con, um, parameters of accessibility and confidentiality. So coming full circle before we take questions, um, I really do think that we are looking at a time in history when ethical thinking is just, uh, we, there's never been a time when we need it more. And there's never been a time where we've been more challenged to think outside of our comfort zone. So we had the trolley problem earlier. You remember pulling the switch to be saved by, by people or not? Well, guess what? Driverless cars. This is a real life tro uh, tro trolley problem. With a driverless car, you ha they have to program in to the car what's the acceptable level of risk. So if there are five pedestrians in, in the crosswalk and it's your, um, your passenger it might, may have to perish to save those five people. This is real life trolley problem now. And I'm gonna read this here. Uh, in a survey conducted by the researchers of this particular um, study I have here, 76% of participants said that it would be more ethical for self-driving cars to sacrifice one passenger rather than kill 10 pedestrians. That's but in just But just 23% said it would be preferable to sacrifice their passenger when only one uh, pedestrian could be saved and only 19% said they would buy a self-driving car if it meant a family member would be sacrificed for the greater good. As we move forward with in this world that we live in, the, the technological advances mean that 
um, when I, well, when I first started working with people back in the dark ages, um, if they were, if the person was nonverbal, a nonverbal communicator, they had a board with maybe 50 or a hundred things on it that they could point to, right? Can you imagine if that, if Stephen Hawking says, if that's all he had to communicate with, where we'd be uh, today with the, with science without him, right? If he, today, if, when I first started working, if a person was deaf blind and they used um, a, uh, an interpreter, they had a tactile interpreter that would speak into the person's hand, right? And so I would speak, the interpreter would be there to relay what I was saying, and, and we'd communicate back and forth using a human, an actual interpreter there, right? Now, if I meet someone who's deaf blind, I can, t I can put an app on my phone and we're tethered and we can communicate all day long, right? Technology has eliminated and alleviated so many barriers for people with disabilities. It's like a miracle. But technology, th there's, there's never just one side of a coin. Technology is now putting us face to face with um, our need for more critical thinking at a time when we really need to think, when it's possible to think much, much, much less. We're coming up with innovations that are absolute undeniable miracles, like the self-driving car that is going to question how we validate humanity. Forget about the genetics research and how um, very soon we're going to be able to possibly eliminate certain types of disabilities, but that also means eliminate certain, certain types of people. And what about enhancing? What about enhancing our genetics? What about the fact that um, already some countries are able to pre-choose male versus female babies? Oh, what if you could enhance those babies? Where are we going with all of this, right? This is the time when we need to be having more critical thinking, not less. And yet the technology makes it easier for us not to be critical thinkers. So this is a really interesting, really interesting period in life. And the trolley problem is, it's not so abstract now when you think of a driverless car, is it? Linda, this is Laura. I just typed what you said. I kind of tried to phrase it into a statement. I'm going to put it in the chat. If you want okay. to confirm that that's, I tried to capture that important thought that you shared. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm going to read that out yeah. maybe to confirm yeah. it. Yeah. We're in a time where critical thinking is more important than ever, but it's also a time where it's possible to do less critical thinking because of technology. I think that's right. And I think, uh, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Kind of a conundrum. It's better and it's more challenging at the same time. It's a great, it's great, you know, great time to be alive. It's a miracle. It's a miracle that we're all here with our faulty brains and all, uh, but technology definitely does make it easier and also more difficult makes it more important for us to all think about thinking, about using that organ that, that fits in our skulls with more intention. All right. That's fine. Any, any questions that anyone would like to ask Linda um, or just thoughts about the training or takeaways, you can use the Q&A and or the chat. Um, but we wanted to leave a few minutes in case you had some comments or questions that you would like to ask while well, we've got, got Linda on the line. I'm really glad so many of you stayed. Ah, oh, thank you. That's nice. Amazing presentation. That's, you're welcome. EP97266. <laughs> ah, yeah, it is that we do get, uh, oh, thanks. I'll never look at baby corn the same. <laughs> I won't either. And I don't need it. I don't need it either. So don't worry. I'm ah. Vegetarian. <laughs> baby corn's a vegetable. I know. Like I like my corn real. Yeah, yeah, me too. 
Okra, okra is right in there with baby corn. They're, they're, I think they're related. I think they're in the same family. Ah, uh, thanks. Thanks. I appreciate the thoughts on the migraine too. Thanks for hanging in with me. There's a few minutes where the thoughts weren't, weren't exactly connecting as well as I'd like, but yeah, we all got to, you know what, if you're thinking of change in the world, people, it all starts with the inside your own skin. And I think the nicer we can be with each other, the more curious that we can be of people who are different from us, the more that we can ask questions and be open to exercising that 40, 40 bits of information that is our conscious brains. I think, you know, I have, I have a lot of faith. I have a lot of faith in the world. And go Wisconsin. And I'm sorry, Viking fan, if I insulted you earlier. No, I'm not. I know who it is. And she can take it. <laughs> Packers are two and zero. Whatever. Who cares? So, <laughs> go Vikings, Heidi. All right. I'd like to thank you for everybody for taking the time to um, spend with spend with us today and spend with me today. I really have. Um, I really do enjoy. I wish we could have all been in a room together because I would have loved to have seen your faces and, and uh, interacted with you. But um, I'm still very grateful that for all of you spending your time with, with us today, so. Um, and thank you very much. And all of our trainings were supposed to be in person this year, obviously, like everyone else. Um, but one of the really beneficial things, um, I'm trying to always find the bright side of our pandemic, um, is we would never have been able to support this training for over 200 people. So by moving virtually this year we've really been able to bring some timely topics to a much broader range of providers not only in wisconsin but we've got folks from out of state as well awesome um, so again thank you very much linda for your time today and thank you everyone for attending just a reminder you will get an email survey so check your spam um, filters i know spam filters are working overtime these days so um, I'm finding things in my junk folder that never would have been there previously. So you'll get a survey, there'll be a handout, and then in there will be the information if you are interested in receiving CRCs and CEUs. We send both automatically to those that request, and you'll have a couple quiz questions to answer in order to earn those. And those will go out by October 22nd. So you don't need to email until after that date. Because um, after that date, if you don't have them, then I'm the one that's behind schedule. So um, thanks again, everyone, and have a great afternoon. And um, take care and stay safe. Bye, everybody. Stay safe. See you next time.